Welcome to the voiceover PowerPoint for positive psychology uh, regarding applied cognitive psychology. Uh, as we move through this course, there are some basics of cognitive psychology that we all have to be on the same page of. And uh, I'm going to go through them here. Uh, we're going to talk about the process of thought, self-talk, the self-fulfilling prophecy, positive thinking, turning potential into success, scotomas, and comfort zones, just so we can all be on the same page. As a brief review, just a reminder that psychology originally came from philosophy. Then we have the five major schools of thought, uh, psychodynamic, behavioristic, cognitive, humanistic, transpersonal, or existential. Uh, now, this, this particular voiceover is focusing on the cognitive psychology, but keep in mind that positive psychology rides between cognitive and humanistic psychology. It was Martin Seligman's concept to build a bridge between cognitive psychology and humanistic psychology, and uh, that's part of what we're doing. So we're going to look at the mind. Okay, and the mind, as we know, is made up of the conscious and the unconscious. In cognitive psychology, the unconscious quite often is referred to as the subconscious. Subconscious and the unconscious are the same things. Okay, it's, they're synonymous. They mean the same thing. So don't get confused by that. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the language of the mind is pictures. We think in pictures. So read this sentence. Were you able to read it? One reason is because we think in pictures. We see the word as a whole, and we don't look at the mistakes. This is another reason you need to proofread your papers before you turn them in. So this computer, our brain, processes 400 billion, that's billion with a B, bits of information per second. Our conscious awareness can only process 2,000 bits per second, okay? So we cannot possibly process all the information that's available to us. On the brain is another physical item. It runs like a net, of, uh, like a hairnet, almost from the back of the brain to the forebrain, and it's called the reticular activating system, or the RAS. Uh, and what this, what the, the reticular system does, or the reticular formation, uh, is it acts like a filter. Uh, all the information that comes into us comes in through our five senses. And if where you're sitting, if you were to take in all the light that you could see, uh, you would be overwhelmed. Your, your brain tunes part of this light out. If you could hear all the sounds that that were available to you. You would be overwhelmed by sound. So the reticular activating system acts as this filter in our conscious mind. Uh, our consciousness is our awareness. Uh, remember we uh, mentioned earlier that we have the conscious and the unconscious. So right now we're talking about the conscious. So what danger, love, fear and beauty kind of override everything else uh, when it comes into things that will they will uh, take over the the importance or the precedence uh, th that we filter through and of course fear and danger uh, get th the ultimate precedence so for example if you're sitting in uh, your living room and you're reading a book uh, and you're totally into the book or kind of zoned out or maybe even napping and the fireplace uh, throws a spark out and catches the rug on fire, uh, and you smell smoke, 
it's your reticular activating system says danger danger uh, wake up pay attention to what's going on here uh, it overrides uh, your need to read the book or to sleep or whatever does that make sense in your weekly folder there's a an assignment uh, regarding the reticular activating system the RAS uh, so make sure you check the instructions and the due date. It's going to get. It's going to send you on a, uh, uh, a kind of a treasure hunt, uh, looking for several items. Uh, they're listed here, uh, but you don't have to remember them now. Uh, it'll all be in the instructions. But it will show you why the RAS is important, and then how you can turn around and use it for yourself. With the process of thought, we're going to. Uh, look at the computer model of the brain that's often used in cognitive psychology. Now remember that the mind and brain are two separate entities, but they are connected, they overlap in a lot of their duties. So the, the brain is the supercomputer. It's in charge of systems management. It gets its input from the five senses, uh, and then if on the conscious level, it puts things through the reticular activating system. So from the reticular activating system, things go to that keyboard uh, where once they go to the keyboard, they get entered. Uh, that is another way of saying you're giving it sanction. Okay, The more often an idea or an opinion gets entered or given sanction, the stronger that program becomes in us the more it becomes a part of us. So from there, when it gets entered, it goes into the conscious, which is like our computer screen. It's what we're aware of, it, where it perceives, associates, evaluates, and then that's where you make your decisions. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the... Uh, the conscious level of this and the unconscious is the there's a three-dimensional uh, concept thought has three dimensions words pictures and emotions okay now if you think of words it's like hitting the enter button one time if it's a picture it's like hitting the enter button 10 times. If it's an emotion, it could be a hundred times or a thousand times. So if I say the word dog, okay, you, you think of a dog. If I say German Shepherd, uh, you think of a, a specific dog. It's, it's a much clearer picture for you. If you were bitten uh, by a German Shepherd when you were a child, the emotion uh, comes right back to you. It's in there uh, so much more than uh, if you just said the word dog. So keep this in mind as we move towards and we talk about uh, emotions, the broaden and build theory. So then there's the hard drive, the subconscious. Okay, the subconscious takes in everything. 80 to 90 percent of our life is run by our subconscious. It stores our programming, all our conditioning. That includes truths, reality, self-images, habits, attitudes, assumptions. It also associates with our emotions, our intuitions, and our gut feelings. Okay, the, the subconscious takes it all in, literally, black and white makes no judgments on what's good or bad or right or wrong. Now, there's a program, and we'll call that the creative subconscious. Uh, so that program uh, takes in things, and it wants to maintain our sanity and reality. <clears throat> So the creative subconscious is a program, okay, and its main job is to keep us sane, okay, 
uh, it, it seeks answers and solutions. Uh, it resolves conflict. Uh, it's goal-oriented. Uh, it creates our drive and energy. Uh, but the thing it does the most is it tries to keep us sane by keeping our pictures straight, if you will. So what are the pictures? There are self-images. All of these things go into uh, the creative subconscious, and it wants to keep them that way, okay? Because that's what it knows, that's what it thinks is important. So it's going to try to maintain the status quo, if you will. Now, all of this is a huge feedback loop, and it happens in an instant, okay? As, as I said before, 80 to 90 percent of, of our life is run by the subconscious. So we don't think about all of these things. So as we home in on the, on the self-image, we put our focus on the self-image, remember that the creative subconscious is trying to maintain our self-images. So what are these self-images? They're just our opinions of ourselves, our stored beliefs about ourselves. And how many do we have? We have hundreds, maybe even thousands. I often use the, the example of the clumsy child uh, to to uh, give you a better idea of self-image and how we develop these self-images. Okay, so uh, let's say there's a three or four year old kid uh, named Kevin. He comes toddling into the living room, trips over the carpet, and dad says, oh God, Kevin, you sure are uh, clumsy. And then at dinner, he knocks over his milk. Mom says, geez, Kevin, you sure are clumsy. Now. He may not be any more clumsy than any other uh, three or four year old, but if they continue to tell him that he's clumsy, he will start to believe it. And over time, he will become and act clumsy. Okay, so that by the time he gets to grade school, uh, he's, he's known as Clumsy Kevin. And uh, if this continues through, Grade school, every time he does something clumsy, somebody reminds him of it, it gets imprinted even more. It gets entered, entered, entered. So he's, uh, so let's say nice. he's now in, in junior high uh, or high school and he's going to his first dance and he sees Jenny across the way. He's going to go over there and say hello to Jenny, maybe ask her to dance. He thinks he should take over... Uh, maybe some punch or something so he could start a conversation. He screws up his courage, and then uh, he starts walking across uh, the gym. And what's going on inside him is his creative subconscious is saying, boy, we, we haven't done anything clumsy in a while. We need to do something clumsy. Now, he's totally unaware of this, but when he gets close to Jenny, he stumbles and spills the, the red punch all over her beautiful white dress, okay? And, of course, everybody says, oh, Kevin, you're so clumsy. How could you be that clumsy? Now, is, is Kevin doomed to be clumsy the rest of his life? Not necessarily. He could get out of it. He probably needs to do something dramatic like uh, play some sports or uh, take martial arts or take dance even somewhere we could get some body awareness, and he's got to change his self-talk in, in order to change his self-image. Uh, and we'll talk about that some more in a minute. Now, the thing to keep in mind about these self-images is that they self-regulate, okay? So they're, they're like a thermometer, uh, or I mean a thermostat. So you have a, a thermostat that you set on, say, 68. Uh, if it goes up to uh, 74, uh, the air conditioner comes on. If it goes down to 64, the heat comes on. So you've got this, this range that nothing really happens uh, with it, but if it, it self-regulates. Now, the best example I can give of this is I used to work with a golfer uh, for performance enhancement, and he was a 10 handicap. That means he shot 
10 over par. Uh, and he must have told me 20 times the first time we sat down that he was a 10 handicap. So, And he needed to become a 6 handicap and just shoot 6 over par in order for him to win his, uh, his club tournament. Uh, so my job was to help him to get down to a 6 handicap. One of the things that I asked him was, how did he, you know, how did his session go? Was it always the same? He said, well, he usually played very well, uh, just one or two over par the first 12 or 13 holes, and then he would blow up. And for three or four holes, he would just, he would shoot terrible, and then he would uh, he would come in, he would be 10 over par. Uh, he would get his, get his groove back and be 10 over par. And so I asked him, did he ever start off poorly? He said, yes, he started, sometimes he started off poorly, but after three or four holes, he would pick it up. And I said, well, so what did you score then? He said, well, 10 over par, you know, give or take a stroke. I'm a 10 handicap. So I said, well, one of the things you've got to do is start saying you're a six handicap. And he says, but I'm not, I'm a 10 handicap. I said, I know, but you believe that. But if you continue to say that, you'll remain a 10 handicap. Uh, it, it took a lot of convincing, but it finally worked. And he shot six over par. Unfortunately, uh, the guy he was playing against shot five over par and beat him. I mentioned that we've got these hundreds, maybe even thousands of self-images. So one way to look at this would be uh, as like this big mixing board here. Uh, you've got this huge mixing board and think each of those dials is a self-image. So who's in charge of this? Well, it's not you consciously, that's for sure. It's the, it's the creative subconscious. It's the one moving the big dials, trying to keep everything in the status quo. Okay. Uh, it controls, it tries to keep the picture of your self-image straight, okay? The creative subconscious, the way it works, uh, some of the ways that it works is like through homeostasis, gestalt, and perceptual organization. Homeostasis, you know, is keeping balance. You learned that in your high school uh, biology class, if you get too hot, you start sweating to cool down. If you get cold, you start shivering to warm up. <clears throat> Gestalt is, is making a hole or a pattern, uh, seeing the whole thing. A hole is greater than the sum of its parts. So if you look at the image on the right-hand side, uh, you see generally people describe that as a man on a horse. Uh, in reality, it's just a bunch of splotches. But uh, the People, we, our brain fills in the blanks, and we and we get the gestalt. We get the person on the horse, and then there's perceptual organization, uh, and that's where the the uh, we look at that image on the right, and we say something's wrong here. Something's not right, and in our mind we try to fix it, and that's one of the things that the creative subconscious tries to do. I want to shift our focus again uh, to now to look at positive self-talk. Okay, uh, I was fortunate in uh, my career as an athletic trainer uh, to work with uh, Ken Revisa. Ken was one of the uh, original uh, sports psychologists, one of the first guys out as uh, as a sports psychologist back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I worked with him in the 90s. He's the one that really got me interested in, uh, in psychology. And when he came to the Jets to, to work with our coaches, uh, do some team building with a group that had never worked together before. And uh, I used to pump him for information all the time. And he indicated to me he's the one that let me in on how important self-talk was. All great athletes 
use positive self-talk. When you look at the stuff over on the right, uh, you can see uh, what it what they use it for to elevate motivation, enhance focus and concentration, and help with stress management. Every sports psychology mental skills training program uses a, the the base of it is self-talk, positive self-talk. So what is self-talk? It's just those conversations we have with ourselves. Anytime you talk to yourself aloud or uh, just inside your head, you're, ha you're having self-talk. Uh, when you give sanction to something, you say, I am that, uh, it helps create the self-image. It gets entered. Okay, repetitive sanctions develop into attitudes, which can move into assumptions. Uh, if they're strong enough, they can become beliefs. And I'll explain to you in a minute why those are important. Keep in mind, we move toward and become like what we think. So I want you to understand the concept of the self-talk cycle. Uh, so we have this self-talk uh, that determines our self-image, okay? The self-image, in turn, determines our performance or our behavior, and it's a feedback loop. So if you think in terms of what we talked about in the earlier uh, video on the process of thought of the clumsy child, uh, as, the clumsy, as the child internalizes uh, and says, I am clumsy, then he or she becomes clumsy. They, they move and act in the way that they think and talk to themselves. Okay, this is critical. Uh, it's so simple, yet it, it impacts our entire life. Now to emphasize the importance of this simple tool known as self-talk. I want you to watch this brief clip from my favorite movie, What the Bleep Do We Know, on the next slide. in the molecular structure of water and what affects it. Now, water is the most receptive of the four elements. Mr. Emoto thought perhaps it would respond to non-physical events. So he set up a series of studies, applied mental stimuli, and photographed it with a dark field microscope. This first picture is a picture of water from the Fujiwara Dam. And this picture is the same water after receiving a blessing from a Zen Buddhist monk. Now, in this next series of pictures, Mr. Emoto printed out words, taped them to bottles of distilled water, and left them out overnight. This first photograph is a picture of the pure distilled water, just the essence of itself. These subsequent photographs, as you can see, are each different. This is the Chi of Love. And we move along here to thank you. And you can see where he taped that uh, to this bottle here. But if you read Japanese, you already knew that. <laughs> now, Mr. Emoto speaks of the thought or intent being the driving force in all of this. The science of how that actually affects the molecules is unknown, except to the water molecules, of course. And it's really fascinating when you keep in mind that 90% of our bodies are water. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? If thoughts can do that to water, Imagine what our thoughts can do to us.
I don't know what to say, you know. I've, I just do what I do and it worked, yeah. I don't know what to say, mate. Did you surprise yourself when the first initial attack went and you were able to go and then go again and attack that group? Was that something you'd planned? Look, you just got to ask yourself all the time, you know. If he's hurting you, God knows what he's doing to the others. I know I'm in great shape. I just keep thinking that in my head, you know. If I'm hurting, I know everyone else is. So I just kept that in my head and I knew eventually it will pay off. So After a performance like today, does that give you new confidence to do something very special uh, by the end of Paris here? I just keep going, you know, day by day. I keep saying day by day, but just keep going. I never think too far ahead. And everyone keeps talking to me about what's ahead, what's ahead. That doesn't help my concentration. I just go day by day. I've trained for this mentally as well as physically. And I go day by day. That's what we do. Whatever we do, we go day by day. How can you think three days ahead when you've got two days before that? That's how you crack. That's how you cock things up. So day by day. Thanks, Bradley. Negative self-talk is obviously the opposite of positive self-talk. It's negative thinking. It's, a, it's like an assault or an attack on your brain. Okay? Negative self-talk is anything that takes you away, away from your goals or the behavior or performance that you want. So that includes sarcasm, belittling, putting putting yourself or others down, ranking people, all of that stuff has to go. Here's your next homework assignment. Uh, I want you to get a rubber band and place it around your wrist. And I want you to leave it on for a minimum of 24 hours. And every time you catch yourself saying something negative, now negative in this sense means something that's not toward your goals. But even if it's sarcasm, if it's belittling somebody or ranking or putting them down, that's negative. Anything that you consider a negative statement, especially about yourself, but other people too, you snap that rubber band on your wrist and you say, stop it. Okay? Now later on, as you become aware of this, a second area of this, if you want to change something, uh, let's say uh, you feel like your, your self-talk regarding test taking uh, is bad and you, or is negative. You have a, your negative self-talk is, uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to flunk this test. I know I, I don't understand anatomy and physiology. I'll never get this. So each time you say that, you snap the rubber band, you say stop it, then you add, that's not like me anymore. I'm very good at taking anatomy and physiology. I take tests well. I always succeed when I take a test. You have to change your self-talk in order to change your self-image. When you can change that self-image, your performance will follow. Does that make sense? Your performance will follow. Now, it may not be absolutely true at the time, but that's the way this works. So I want you to, for at least, your homework is for 24 hours, you wear this rubber band, and anytime you catch yourself saying something negative, uh, you're going to snap the rubber band. And your homework will be to do a reflection on it. Those exam those directions will be given online on Blackboard. So one of the things to keep in mind about uh, self-talk is that not only must it be positive, it needs to be in the present tense. I am. I am now. Uh, you have to eliminate, I will do this. I'm going to do it. I'm trying to do it. Notice the quote from uh, Muhammad Ali. I am the greatest. He said it long before he, uh, he ever became the greatest. And then you need to follow advice of my mentor, Yoda. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. Here's a list of a lot of uh, positive self-talk, a lot of positive affirmations. Uh, these are, you know, 
spoken in the I am, and then you can look on the right-hand side, you see some of the affirmations that are used in 12-step programs all the time. But these are just for your own uh, benefit in case you want to start creating some affirmations. So remember, beliefs shape our reality. I'm not going to get into a whole discussion now about consciousness, but we are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make our world. Okay, so now I want to shift gears a little bit uh, from uh, positive self-talk to talk about the self-fulfilling prophecy. It's also called the, uh, the Pygmalion effect. Our beliefs, <clears throat> our actions uh, towards others impact the others' beliefs about us which causes them to act in a way towards us, which reinforces our beliefs about ourselves. Uh, and, and again, that's a feedback loop. So the self-fulfilling prophecy. Remember, thoughts drive our emotion. Uh, negative emotions, you know from the broaden and build theory, narrow our thinking. We want to have that broad, wide open thinking. So, Here's how the self-fulfilling prophecy works in life. Uh, Roger Bannister in 1954 was the first man to break the four minute mile uh, running. And at the time, he was a doctor. And at the time, people said it was physiologically impossible for a human to, to run faster, run a mile faster than four minutes, okay? As a doctor, uh, as a physician, he, he couldn't understand why people said that. He thought that we could. So he trained and trained, and in May of 1954, he ran a three-minute, 59-second mile. Uh, the world uh, called him the fastest man alive. Uh, everybody was amazed and so forth. Six weeks later, uh, somebody broke his record. Okay, the next year, 37 people did it. So once it was done, uh, you know, a couple years later than that, 300 people did it. Once somebody broke that barrier and people believed they could run faster than that, uh, then they did. So if you didn't believe you could run a four-minute mile, you couldn't. So at the, at the crux of all of this is belief. And remember, our self-talk creates our self-image. That feeds into our beliefs. So there's an experiment in social psychology called Pygmalion in the Classroom, uh, where, and I'm just going to briefly describe it. They took a, uh, a school district out in California, uh, I think of sixth graders, and uh, several different schools. And so they split the, the, each of the sixth grade into three sections. And for each section, they told the teacher a, a different thing. They said, uh, okay, uh, teacher A, you get the smart people. Uh, you, we're putting all the smartest people in your class. Teacher B, you get, the, you get a normal classroom of mixed group. Uh, and teacher C, uh, I'm sorry, but you're going to be teaching uh, all of the, the dummies. You're going to be teaching the people that have challenges. So what do you think happened? Uh, the, the teachers, unbeknownst to them, uh, the, the class was made up of, uh, of regular classes. They did not sp spread the, the students out. They did not split them up. They had normal a normal spread of students, smart students, average students, and and below average students. Uh, but in the teacher that taught the the A group, they had everybody got good grades. The teacher that taught the B group, uh, that had the normal spread as usual, and the teacher that taught the uh, C group. Uh, they they learned down to her expectations. So even the smart students in her classroom didn't do well. Okay, they taught 
to how they thought the students would do. So if the in the A group, if the students uh, weren't doing well, that teacher thought, it, well, maybe it's my fault because these are smart kids. So I need to work a little harder with them. Uh, in the C group, uh, the teacher didn't even try to teach extra hard, uh, even the smart kids, because she said, well, these kids are dumb. They're not going to learn. So this is, they created a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, hopefully you're starting to see how that works now. And we do this all the time. We create our own self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, now, we're going to shift gears from the social psychology into humanistic psychology, and in particular, the self-help movement. Um, the self-help movement, uh, if you go into Barnes & Noble and look uh, on the shelves, uh, there's you know a huge section of all the books and stuff that are on the uh, uh, the shelves uh, for self-help, and that, and they're all based in humanistic psychology, in that we can be the best that we want to be. Uh, you can be uh, you can be the best as long as you can see it, you can achieve it. Uh, so Napoleon Hill uh, started back in 1937, interviewing all the successful people like Henry Ford. Uh, asking them, you know, what made them successful. And the, his book is still sold uh, quite a bit uh, now. Uh, there's over 100 million copies of it sold. Uh, it holds up today. As a matter of fact, my, uh, my, one of my sons uh, just got a hold of a copy a, a year or so ago and was telling me like it was new stuff. Uh, I read it 20 years ago. So then the, in the next thing in the 50s, uh, Norman Vincent Peale came up with the term, The Power of Positive Thinking, uh, entitled his book. Uh, and what he said is, you know, create great expectations. If you believe in them, you'll achieve them. So the one thing that all of the everything on the, the self-help books have all of them from uh, Carl Sagan uh, to Dr. Seuss uh, is positive thinking. Uh, so you, in order to think positive, you have to pay attention to your self-talk. So that can be positive. Remember we talked about failure. Uh, Michael Jordan, I failed over and over again. That's why I succeed. Uh, Thomas Edison says I failed my way to success. Now, reframe that using positive self-talk. Uh, Thomas Edison says snap that rubber band. Uh, I've not failed. I've found 10,000 ways that won't work. I'm getting closer to my goal. Okay, that's the snap it. That's changing it around to the positive. Now, one of the things that I think you need to really recognize is that there are limits to positive thinking. There are proponents in positive thinking that if something goes wrong in your life, uh, those people say it's because you had bad thinking. You weren't thinking properly. All I have to do is look at childhood cancer and say, well, that's not accurate. Okay, uh, so keep in mind uh, this later on down the line, especially when we study forgiveness and if we look at the dark night of the soul, just because something isn't your fault doesn't mean it's not your problem. So positive thinking has its limits. Some things are not your fault, but they are your problem. Does that make sense? Uh, the cognitive approach for success talks about how we take our potential, those are our capabilities to achieve, and, and we turn them into success. Anthony Robbins, the, the gentleman who's pictured on the right, is a very famous uh, guru when it comes to uh, self 
help for success. He's got programs you may, if you stay up late at night, you may see him on infomercials and so forth. He's been doing this for well over 20 years now, and he's one of the leaders in the field. Uh, extremely successful, and uh, a lot of people have looked at his information to become successful. And one of the things that uh, Tony Robbins says is that we have unlimited potential. So what do you think that means, unlimited potential? Uh, you know from above what our potential is. Is it unlimited? Is that true? Is that right? If it's not, what limits it? Well, I'll tell you a couple of things that limit it. Our physicalness limits us. For example, uh, I'm five foot nine, and even at uh, even when I was a young man, uh, I could not dunk a basketball. So no, I had the potential to dunk, but my vertical jump was about four inches, uh, and you know I could have practiced and worked and uh, committed myself, lifted weights, and done all sorts of exercises, but it's unlikely that I would have ever been able to dunk the basketball uh, without the help of a trampoline or standing on somebody's shoulders. So there are things that limit us, but what is unlimited is our imagination and our vision. And I like to say, if you can see it, you can be it. If you can picture in your mind the goal that you want, then you can achieve it. So if you can see it, you can be it. So we have this potential, and we're trying to turn it into performance. Okay, we're trying to take it and turn it into performance. You all have the potential to get A's in your A and P, and not only to score an A, but to learn the material. You all have the potential to do that. Now, what keeps you from doing that? Sometimes there are obstacles, like a brick wall, that get in our way. And they can usually be knocked down to five areas. Habits, attitudes, assumptions, beliefs, and expectations. So you've got all of this potential, and it hits the brick wall, and you get just a little trickle or dribble of your performance. So habits, attitudes, assumptions, beliefs, and expectations are obstacles to our successful performance. Just so, again, so that we're on the same page, uh, here's a definition of those five obstacles to success. Habits, attitudes, assumptions, beliefs, and expectations. Habits are those regular tendencies. Uh, they're routine. We do them without thinking. Okay? Attitudes are our opinions or ways of thinking. And our performance or our behavior generally reflects our attitudes. Assumptions are much more perversive. Uh, Assumptions are much more pervasive, okay? They're more like uh, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. That's an assumption. It's when something's taken for granted and not thought about. It is assumed, okay? That can get you in trouble, too. Uh, beliefs are really firm opinions, attitudes, and assumptions. We accept them as truth, and when people attack our truths, we we want to fight them. We do not want to give up on our truths. Expectations are just something that uh, we, an outcome that's likely to happen uh, if you're pregnant in nine months, you expect to have a baby, okay? Uh, we expect something to occur in a predictable manner. So you have these five obstacles that turn that can be turn your potential into minimal performance we want to learn how to take them and make them into accelerators for success okay so you want to take that potential and file it through here and use them to actually increase the potential in the successful performance and that's money in the bank when you do that Ways to do that 
are using essential mental skills, uh, goal setting, visualization, feelization, energy management, effective thinking, and a big component of effective thinking is what we talked about in, in uh, VoiceOver PowerPoint 2, self-talk. And then all of those things, when you put them together, help you become more mentally tough, uh, help with your, your persistence and your resilience uh, as you go to achieve your goals. Now, there are always going to be obstacles in the, in the way. Uh, you can be lost. You can be stuck. Uh, you get stuck in the sand. Uh, you can have a little rock in the road that might get in your way. Uh, obstacles and uh, adverse conditions are going to happen to us. The question is, are we bringing them on ourselves, or is it just part of being alive? There are more things under your control than you would like to believe. Another thing that can never negatively impact your performance are scotomas. Uh, scotoma, the word comes from the Greek or the Latin and means blind spot. Most often you hear it referred to in, in, uh, from ophthalmologists or ophthalmologists when they give you a visual field uh, study and there's a blind spot like on the, on the image at the right. In cognitive psychology, uh, it refers more to what is it I cannot see? What is it that's here that I'm not seeing? We mentally can form blind spots uh, and not see something that may be right before our eyes. When you look at this picture, some of you may have seen it before. It's been around quite a while. There's a lady in the picture. It's an old lady or a young lady. Do you see an old lady or a young lady? Uh, if you see the old lady, you see someone that may be described as uh, old, uh, as not too pretty. Uh, she's even been described as an old hag. Uh, if you see the young lady, you see a petite woman who seems to be looking over her shoulder. She has. She seems to be dressed well, has a, a necklace on. So which of these do you see? Because they're both in the picture. Can you see the young lady or the old lady? Now perhaps if I show you these pictures, if you see this picture first, you may see the young lady. If you see this picture first, you would probably see the old lady. And the story goes that this was an experiment at one of the Ivy League schools uh, between debate teams. Of course, the debate teams didn't know they were in an experiment. That's before we had to tell people they were in experiments. And one debate team was shown the young lady on the right. One debate team was shown the young lady on, or the old lady on the left. Then they were brought together and they projected the picture that's in the middle. And they debated whether it was a young lady or an old lady. And the legend goes that eventually it broke into a fist fight and they had to be had the police had to be called in because they couldn't agree whether it was an old lady or a young lady. Well what I want you to get out of this is that there are two ladies in the picture. And that that's a scotoma. So remember, we all have scotomas. Now Thinking back to the old lady, young lady uh, that we used for an example, if you locked on to the old lady, you locked out the young lady. Uh, if you locked on to the young uh, lady, you locked out the old lady, and vice versa. Uh, so the thing to remember is when you run into a situation where you're not seeing something, where you're not understanding it, you have to ask yourself the questions. What am I missing? What is it I'm not seeing? Get used to asking those questions. Your reticular activating system will in turn find the answers for you. Does that make sense? A lot of times you've heard the old saying, I can't see the forest for the trees. And what that means is that you're caught in the forest. You're caught in the details of the things. You can't even see that it's a forest because you're so 
tied up in the minutia of what's going on at the moment. Uh, one of the corporate buzzwords is get some height on it. And what this comes from is the example of using uh, being in a helicopter uh, traveling at 200 miles an hour, but if you're only 500 feet above the ground, everything is a blur. So if you move up to 1,500 feet above the ground, even though you're still going uh, 200 miles an hour, now you can see things clearly. Okay, so when you're having a problem, you need to ask yourself, what is it I'm not seeing? I need to get some height on this. I need to get out of the forest, get out of the trees, and look for the whole forest. What's the big picture here? These are some things, some self-talk items that you want to condition yourself. Okay, so here's what, one thing I want you to get out of this uh, in this short session is the three headbutt rule. When you're trying to take your potential and turn it into performance and you hit the brick wall and you hurt your head, there's a tendency to say, I'll just have to work hard. Harder. Now, I'm not saying I don't want you to work hard. Working hard is understood. When you're in college, when you're at your job, I'm assuming you're going to work hard to do what you need to do to get the job done, to be the best you can be. You wouldn't be in college if you didn't want to improve your situation. Okay? So, working harder is not always the secret. Because if you're doing the same thing incorrectly, it's not going to help you. And when you're, when you're hitting your head against the wall, you're, not getting, you're getting minimal performance or no performance. So I'm sure most of you have heard the definition of uh, insanity as doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Well, that's what happens when you get, fall into the hard work myth. I used to work for a head coach, Joe Walton, uh, who, whose motto was, when things are not going right, you just have to work harder. And every year, uh, as the team would get beat up during the season and we moved forward, uh, if we lost a game in November, then he would work them harder. And then we'd lose another game and he would work them harder still. And we would just go downhill and we always finished up with in bad shape. So he would do the same thing over and over again. He could have definitely done well with a three headbutt rule. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, he didn't listen to me. Another area that we need to be concerned with, and which can influence and, and encourage our scotomas, are comfort zones. Now, comfort zones are exactly what they sound like. There are areas in our lives that we're familiar with. It's where we are comfortable. Uh, when you come into class, when you sit in a classroom, uh, you generally find a seat, and even if it might not have been your first choice, uh, the next time you come to class, there's a tendency to go to that seat. And after a while, that becomes your seat in that classroom for that class. It may be different in that same classroom for a different class. But there's a, there's a comfort zone that we get familiar with and we like that comfortableness. When we move out of our comfort zone, we experience dissonance. That's the feeling of unease that we have. Ill at ease. You've all had it. You've been in a place, uh, in a situation that you were uncomfortable in. If the, let's say, for example, if I called on you and asked you to come up in the beginning, in the front of the room and give a presentation and you weren't prepared, you would have dissonance about that. Uh, it brings to mind a story that I had when I was teaching at the Catherine Gibbs schools in uh, Manhattan. Now the Gibbs schools are proprietary schools. They're a lot like uh, ITT schools. They teach a lot of uh, uh, short programs uh, 12 month year uh, year long programs year and a half long programs and they have associate degrees uh, but they, they did like uh, legal executive assistance they teach a lot of computer programming and so forth but the Gibbs schools used to be secretarial schools 
And uh, the first year I taught there, I didn't have a problem. The next year I was on the main floor. On the main floor they have, uh, in the office they have uh, all these pictures, of the old pictures of the uh, 1940s and 1950s women dressed, you know, putting on their white gloves and looking uh, dressed for work at, at that era. And, you know, things that would be politically incorrect now, like uh, be a Gibbs girl, uh, you know, because it was just a secretarial school there. Well, the first night I was teaching on the main floor, I went to go into the to the restroom, and so I went in the men's room door and opened the door, and oh my gosh, I looked down this long hallway, and all the stalls were pink. The floor was pink, the walls were pink, there was a big long mirror along the other thing, and there was not a urinal in sight. I was immediately out of my comfort zone, okay? I felt this dissonance in my gut and in my chest, and I said, oops, and I averted my eyes, looked down, backed out. Now, as I was coming out of the door, I said, I could have swore I thought that door said <coughs> men's room. So I looked at the door. Sure enough, there was a sign on it that said men's room. And I thought, well, maybe I was confused here. So I looked back in the, the bathroom. I kind of poked my head in. And uh, I said, hello, is anyone there? And I got no answer. And I started thinking, oh, this could be really bad. If I, you know, if I go in here and there's a woman in here, I could get accused of uh, some kind of perversion or something. I would never be able to teach again. Uh, this could be really embarrassing. And, and the dissonance just became so incredibly large that I had to back out of the room again. So I started thinking, well, may, maybe, the, maybe the guys in the school are playing a trick and they've put the, the men's sign on the door of the women's restroom. And so I looked at the, the sign hanging on the door, but no, nope, it wasn't there. It was, I mean, the sign had been there for a while. You could see the paint around it where they had painted around it. So nobody had played a trick on me. So about this time I looked across the hall and there were two young guys, two students, uh, kind of leaning on uh, the door across the hall or the doorway, which was, goes into the student lounge. And they were kind of chuckling. And they looked at me and they said, that's okay, teach. We all go through that. That is the men's room. So I said, oh, okay. I recognize what they had done. This used to be an all-women's school. They had just put a men's sign on the door and it became, a, you know, the men's room. They never bothered to change the, the color uh, of the room. It was still pink. Uh, so I went back into the pink palace. I refer to it now as... And uh, guess what? I couldn't perform. I was still out of my comfort zone. So regardless of, uh, uh, of how, even though I knew that this was now the men's room, being out of your comfort zone keeps you from being able to perform at your best. Uh, it took me quite a while to get over it. Uh, by the end of the night, my bladder was so full that I had to go in there and perform. Uh, and it took less and less, each time I did it, it was less and less dissonance until I became used to it. And then several, and then about two years ago, uh, this was about eight years after this experience, when I was taking my coursework up at Virginia Tech, uh, I was taking it in a building that used to be a, a woman's dorm. And I we went on break, I went into the men's room, and sure enough, it was pink. It wasn't nearly as big and nearly as intimidating, but I got that dissonance immediately at first, and then I said, oh, wait a minute, I've been here before, I've done this before, I understood. I still checked to make sure it said men's room, and then I went in, and I was able to perform. this, when you look at this picture, think about, reflect for a moment, 
does it cause any dissonance? Is it somehow not what you would expect? That you would have a Marine dressed in, in dress blues with an end the war sign. Think about it. Does it put you out of its comfort zone? Might it put someone else out of their comfort zone? What story do you think goes along with this? Think about it. So one way we can help ourselves is to stretch our comfort zones. Okay, what, a great way to do this is to open up your reticular activating system. Remember your homework uh, for the RAS where you're looking for those items, the balloons, the bulldog, the yellow submarine, and so forth. You're telling your awareness to be open, to look for this, because when you look for things, you will find it. Your subconscious, once it's programmed to do something, it tells the brain, you keep looking. We're going to find it. So one way to expand your comfort zone is to do what I call zooming. Okay, and that zooming is simply doing the same thing that you always do, just a little different. So one way to zoom would be if you take the same way, if you drive the same way to work or school every day, you change, your, you change the way you go. Go a different way. Uh, take a different approach. Go around uh, the slow way. Or, uh, if, you, if you always, on Friday evenings, you go out for a movie and pizza, uh, go have pizza and a movie. Uh, or, or, you know, switch up. Uh, have something other than pizza. If you go to the same restaurant, change the restaurant. Get used to stretching your comfort zones. Get used to that little dissonance. If you go to the same restaurant all the time, order something different that you don't normally order. That's zooming. Now, on the other side of this, when, you, when it comes time for exams and you're under high stress, you need to retreat into your comfort zones. That is not the time to try new things. It's not the time to go out to a totally new restaurant and try new foods. If you've never, if you've never had sushi before, going out experimenting during exams is probably not the time to do it. You're not going to be able to enjoy it and your comfort zone, uh, you, need to, you need to retreat into that comfort zone when you're under high stress. But in order to grow and to have positive growth and positive change, you need to learn how to stretch your comfort zones. We covered a lot of territory in this uh, voiceover uh, from uh, process of thought, the self-talk, the self-fulfilling prophecy, positive thinking, uh, turning potential into success, a look at scotomas and comfort zones, and all of these things will continue to come up uh, at different times. So uh, know that you can download this and that you can review it at any time. Uh, next, we're going to be looking at uh, the role positive emotion plays.